All right. What's up, uh, American Whiskey Review? What's up, uh, Tyler? Man, today's been a crazy day for me. I literally just got home probably like 20 minutes, 20 minutes ago from work. I had to scramble to get everything set up. And uh, tonight's cocktail is going to be an interesting one for sure. We're going to be uh, doing an all spirits cocktail. So we'll go ahead and uh, give it a couple minutes, get people uh, joined. <laughs> it's your bedtime. And uh, I got a little ways before it's bedtime, uh, 7 o'clock. So I try to be uh, on the dot on these. We'll see. I didn't do a lot of uh, pre-advertising on this one, so we might not have too many people actually join today. Oh, yeah. So, uh, let's see. American Whiskey Review. I am going to get into this bad boy here pretty soon. So, that old Forester that you sent me, I'm getting more and more curious about it. And so I'm going to probably crack that, you know, maybe tonight or maybe tomorrow. But that one's, that one's up on the docket. I need to open that one up and check it out. Especially after I saw you post about it the other day. Got me even more curious about it. We, uh, here, let me see if I can get in. So there's a little baby old forester in there. If you guys want to see something really cute. Look at this whistle pig bottle. So, give you an idea of scale. It's like a little baby whistle pig. My, uh, one of my really good buddies got married this past weekend and he told me to bring a flask. And so I did, but then we ended up drinking it sooner than we anticipated. And so then I ran to the liquor store and I was like, man, that little baby whistle pig bottle is going to be delicious. And it's also almost the size of a flask. So I bought it and we were sipping on that. That was all that was left of it. All right. So it's a couple minutes past. If anyone has any questions, now's a good time to ask. I'm stalling a little bit until we uh, give some folks an opportunity to get on here. Uh, but tonight we are going to be making the, the Boulevard DA. And I'm uh, excited about making them. It's a whiskey-based cocktail, so there's whiskey in it. Um, it's also going to be a drink that you actually have to stir. Uh, so we're going to learn a little bit about stirring technique tonight um, and what matters and why. Um, and then I actually have a little trick that I do when I make this cocktail uh, to kind of amp it up just a little bit. And so I'll stop talking. I'll get you guys mounted up. And uh, we'll get you started. A variation, it is a very, so this, this cocktail is actually a variation of a Negroni. Um, and I'll talk about that and explain why. Uh, let me go ahead and get you guys mounted up here. But I would say yes, it is probably my favorite variation of a Negroni. All right, so now I am going to go behind the bar. So I am not going to be able to see the screen, uh, but I will come back and I will... <laughs> And I will uh, answer any questions at the end that you might have. And uh, hopefully you learn a thing or two about uh, stirring a cocktail tonight and how to make the Boulevardier. All right, let's get started. All right, so first things first is tonight's cocktail is going to be a cocktail where we're actually going to be using a mixing glass. And so the difference between a mixing glass and a tin is usually your tin shaker is just that it's to shake cocktails a lot of people ask well what's the difference like why do you shake some cocktails and why not others and how do you know which ones to shake and which ones not to shake now, the answer is actually quite simple if you're going to be doing an all spirits based cocktail you always stir it if you're going to be adding any type of fruit juice um, or citrus anything that has something beyond just spirits in it you're going to shake it uh, and that really is the formula for if you choose to use uh, a mixing glass or if you shake it is it all alcohol based mixing glass uh, there's also a technique to how you stir uh, so i'll be covering that with you guys tonight but like i said we're going to be making the uh, boulevardier it is a basically a, a play on the negroni 
Um, some people call it the cousin to the Negroni. Some say it's a riff to the Negroni. For those of you that are not familiar with the Negroni, the reason that everyone says it's so similar to Negroni is because basically it is a Negroni except for instead of using gin, you're using bourbon. Um, so Campari goes into Negroni, uh, your sweet vermouth, vermouth goes into Negroni, uh, but when it comes to uh, the actual extra third spirit, it's going to be gin. The other difference between a Negroni and the Boulevardier that we're making tonight is that the Boulevardier actually calls for a little bit more bourbon than you would normally put in, uh, than normally you would use gin in the Negroni. Uh, so one and a half ounces of bourbon versus equal parts for the Negroni, which would be one, one, one. So we're doing one and a half for the Boulevardier, uh, one ounce of the sweet vermouth, and then one ounce of the Campari. And I'm gonna stir that. Now, the other thing that I'm gonna show you in regards to tools is a mixing spoon. So these come in different styles, different colors. Um, some of them have a big flat disc on the top. Uh, the reason that some of them have a big flat disc on the top is to actually do muddling. So if you have that, you can do some muddling. Uh, I just like plain old bar spoon. Um, the reason that they're also kind of swirled at the top is one, it's for grip, but it's also uh, the spoon will actually spin around in your fingers as you're stirring. And that's how you're also knowing uh, if you're using proper technique. Um, as always, I have my accurate measure. So this does uh, everything from a quarter ounce to completely full. It's three ounces. Uh, it's gonna be important tonight with what we're gonna be doing. And uh, I'm using the julep strainer. So a julep strainer is traditionally what is used if you're using a mixing glass. And the reason being is they tend to fit better into the mixing glass. So you actually wanna put the julep strainer into the mixing glass when you do your pour at the end. Uh, versus a Hawthorne strainer will usually just kind of rest on top and it creates a little bit of a gap on the lip. And so sometimes you can get a lot more ice uh, chips and stuff that, you know, break off when you're stirring it to fall into your glass. And most people don't like that. Um, what's really cool about my julep strainer, and I'll brag about this one a little bit, is uh, my wife gave this to me for Christmas. Uh, my julep strainer is actually from 1877. Uh, so this is an all silver. It's a little bit tarnished looking and a little old for, you know, being over 100 years old. Um, but this is probably one of my prized bar uh, possessions that I have is my julep trainer from 1877. So pretty cool. So let's get started. Um, so this cocktail, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm not a huge fan of all spirits based cocktails. There are a few I like. This one I can actually tolerate. Uh, the reason being is because if I'm going to do an all spirits based cocktail, I'd rather just drink the spirits. Um, find a good balance when you're making an all good spirits cocktail um, it really it adds a lot of complexity and it adds a lot of layers to the drink that you're, you're sipping on and so it can also be a lot of fun uh, this is one of those in particular that'll add a lot of layers uh, the reason that I'm going with a couple of different things is um, that you're probably used to seeing when people build this drink is because uh, I've kind of dialed this cocktail into my taste preference uh, so how I like it and so Campari is Campari this is a bitter aperitif um, that you can find. Uh, Antique form Antica Formula is a sweet vermouth uh, that I prefer over, you know, the Gallo or some of the other brands of sweet vermouth that are out there uh, for a couple reasons. One is I can find it in these cool little half bottles, um, but also this one has a little bit more richness to it. Uh, it's a little bit sweeter, but it also, it also does have a slightly bitter taste to it. Um, and then it has a lot more layers to it. So it's not so one dimensional from a sweet vermouth standpoint. Um, you can pull out some dark fruits in it, uh, some mothery notes in there. Uh, so all around, I think this just adds complexity to the drink. And then when it comes to the bourbon that I chose tonight, uh, I really like to mix with Elijah Craig. And so I know that big red 12 age statement went away. Uh, people hoard those and they still, you know, have them laying around and they probably don't want to mix with them. It's fine, you don't have to. Their new small batch is just as good. It mixes just as well. Um, it just seems to really balance it. For this particular one, my little secret that I bring to it is I actually am going to be adding just a little bit of uh, the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. The reason being is because this is a bourbon forward cocktail, um, it tends to, if you use something like Elijah Craig, it gets a little bit lost uh, when you're using a richer sweet vermouth. And so I just amp it up a little bit um, by putting a higher proof alcohol in there to kind of just give it an extra little nudge forward. Um, so some of those, you know, bourbon, traditional bourbon notes that you like and love so much 
uh, really popping the string. All right, so enough about me talking. Uh, let's go ahead and just start building the string. Uh, so first things first, it's gonna call for uh, one ounce of Campari. So when you're mixing or when you're uh, stirring drinks, all you gotta do is measure and pour right in your mixing glass. So I'm gonna do one ounce of Campari. Next up, I'm gonna be doing uh, one ounce of the Antigua formula or the sweet vermouth. Now the Campari and the sweet vermouth, these are lower proof spirits. Uh, so these do have a shelf life. Um, I don't wanna say that it's you know shorter than anything else you would open, uh, but it does tend to oxidize a little bit quicker if it sits on the shelf. Some people don't mind it so much, um, but for me, I'm a little bit pickier when it comes to the cocktails. And so if it's been on the shelf, if this one's been on the shelf more than say three months, I, I start to really taste that oxidization that takes place in that one. And I usually tend to toss it and just get something new. If you keep these in the fridge, uh, it tends to slow down that oxidization process, uh, but it still will happen over time. But you could probably, you know, squeeze out, you know, push maybe six months before you really start to taste it. All right. So now that we got it in there. Um, the bourbon it calls for is going to be one and a half ounces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one and a quarter ounce of just a regular old small batch. And this is where this uh, measure comes in handy because I can do those quarter ounces. So one and a quarter ounce. And then I'm gonna do the rest of that one and a half ounces with the Elijah Craig Barrel Proof. And we're gonna do some math out there. So if we need one and a half, all I'm gonna be adding to this is just another quarter ounce. Just enough to give it a little extra kick, but not put it over the top. All right. So now that I got all of my booze in my mixing glass, now it's time to add ice. So a little, a little trick when it comes to stirring cocktails is the better quality of the ice that you're using, the better. Uh, so I typically just use the ice from my freezer dispenser in the door of the fridge. And you know, 90% of the time that works just fine. When it comes to stirring cocktails, what happens is that ice that comes out of that freezer door or just that ice that you could buy in bulk at the grocery store, it tends to be a little bit softer and it tends to dilute a little bit quicker. And so when you're stirring cocktails, you really want to make sure that you have a, a, a much harder ice. And so I have one inch cubes um, that I'm going to be using that I got from just using a regular old silicone ice mold that I bought on Amazon. I think some of you know that I bought it, um, you know, just the other day. That's a little too much. And, uh, you know, it just makes for a consistent ice, a uh, hard ice uh, cube that goes into the stirring the drink. Now, some people cool down uh, their mixing glass. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Really what it comes down to is the technique of the stir, uh, being able to get the proper dilution, but also being able to get it nice and cool to the temperature you want. Stirred drinks are never gonna be as cold as shaken drinks. And so you just gotta get over that. Um, so you're gonna go into this drink a little bit warmer than you would a shaken drink uh, by nature. Also, when it comes to buying a mixing glass, um, some of them you know, can be really expensive and usually uh, it's because they're either handmade um, or they're seamless. Seamless means that there's no seam in it. So this one has a seam, um, they're just easier to make and mass produce. All right, now, I always tend to have the spout facing me when I'm doing a stir. And then what I do is I take my spoon and I go behind the ice in the very back of the mixing glass. Then when it comes to actually during the, doing the stir, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get all of the ice to move as one um, in, in that circle as you spin. You don't wanna kinda of stir through the ice and you don't wanna just kinda of just stir like normal. Uh, you actually wanna go around the edge of the mixing glass to get it. So what I've found is a good technique is I put my index finger on the outside towards the back. I put my middle finger on the inside and I put my other, uh, my ring finger back on the outside and then kind of use my thumb and my pinky uh, to also kind of rest it. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to use more wrist motion. Um, so as you go around, you'll notice that the spoon is going around the ice. And then what's happening is it's more of kind of a push pull that's happening and the ice is going around and you'll start to see that dilution and you want to do this for i don't know you know 20 seconds 
maximum. What you're really looking for is you're looking for about three quarters of the ice to kind of just settle down into that mixing glass. So you notice that as I'm spinning this, the spoon is spinning around inside my fingers. The ice is going around as one and it's more of a push pull. There's not a lot of motion going in there. So I'll tell you a little cheater trick that you can do when I get started. I'm still not very good at it is you can turn this upside down and then it's easy to keep it around the glass or you can get grab a chopstick and a chopstick as you go around the glass you can use more of that stirring motion and it will keep your ice going around all right julep strainer on top and because this is more of an antique julep strainer um, it tends to not fit super well it's a little bit small and then i'm just going to go ahead and pour out my cocktail so we should get a nice good full coupe glass on this pour and then I'm actually going to use a garnish tonight. So I got some Luxardo cherries uh, that I put on too thick. And I'm just going to go ahead and drop those in. And there you have it. Boulevardier. Ah, the color of this cocktail is amazing. Ah, it's so good. Using this recipe, I just love it because... You get so much bourbon up front. You really get that signature Elijah Craig that you're used to tasting. And then uh, the sweet vermouth comes in right in the middle and brings a nice, rich sweetness to it. And then the uh, Campari just closes it, closes it out and then just gives it a nice, crisp, bitter finish at the end. Uh, just a fantastic cocktail. That's a good one. For an all spirits cocktail, I can hang with that one. All right. We'll go ahead and grab you and uh, answer any questions that you might have. But uh, there you go. That's the uh, Boulevardier. All right. You guys tolerate that? All right. Here we go. Let's go back. You had Mountain Dew. Let's get amped. Amp it up. <laughs> oh, you guys are funny, man. Chris, Barrels of Match, I thought you were at a basketball game. How are you watching me right now? You're supposed to be watching the basketball game. Have I ever made one using tequila? It's fantastic. I have not, actually. I'm going to have to tell her I'll have to give that one a try. American Whiskey Podcast. I'm a little curious about the vermouth variations. Can you add some clarity? Uh, variations in taste between the different vermouths? Is that what you're asking? Make sure I, I get that right. I'll give you a minute to answer that. <laughs> you're the man. White versus red versus others. Ah, yes. So uh, one is the difference is going to be mostly in taste. Uh, so white vermouths tend to be a little bit more drier. Uh, they use a different grape varietal. Um, you know, think of it as kind of like red wine versus white wine. And so those are usually used, um, you know, to create a more of a drying effect in the cocktail um, or to make it so it's not as sweet. Uh, red vermouths tend to be sweeter. Um, the differences in cost and everything between the bottles varies greatly. And a lot of it has to do with craft and taste. Uh, so if, if I were to, you know, take the example of what I use tonight, the antique uh, formula, sweet vermouth or red vermouth versus say like a gallo red vermouth, um, the difference in cost is pretty vast. So the gallo red vermouth, uh, a full size bottle, uh, is probably going to run in eight, $9. Um, whereas the Antica formula that I'm using is more in the $35 range. Um, but the difference is night and day. The difference would be if we were to translate it into like whiskeys, um, it would be, you know, a Jim Beam would be your Gallo. And then your Antica formula would be, you know, something with a lot more body and spice and character. I don't know. It could be, you know, Elijah Craig Barrel Proof as an example. You know, very night and day. Are all red vermouth sweet vermouth? Yes, they are. K 
Kate loves Luxarda due to the firm texture. Are other cocktail chairs you recommend that aren't too squishy? You know, I'm not a huge garnish guy. Um, so those, those Luxardo cherries that I put in there, you know, those are the only ones I ever buy. Um, I bought some maraschino cherries and those can get a little gross. Um, to me, they just take, taste very medicinal. I don't know about what a firmer cherry would be. I know that some people actually go and buy cherries and then they do their own, um, sort of barrel aging process with them where they just put them in a bottle of, uh, um, what you call it, uh, of bourbon. So you put some bourbon in there, put those cherries in there, and then you can dump some grenadine inside of that uh, to give it a little bit of that, that sugar. And then you just kind of let them sit in there and then soak it all up. And then you can take them out when they're firm so you don't have to have them too squishy. Anything else? Check out my uh, gotcha. Didn't work out. Yeah, I'm lazy, man. I don't do, I don't do fancy things anymore. I used to make my own bitters, um, and make my own tonics for gin and tonics. And, uh, nah, I'm, 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 bo I'm bored of that. There was a question I missed. Let's see. What was it? What was the one I missed? This is my julep strainer. Oh, could you sub Aperol for Campari? You could, yes. It would work. Um, yeah, that would be no problem. Those two sort of... Uh, it's a different taste for sure, um, but they can be substituted for each other. I'm trying to think what else I have down there that also could be substituted. Yeah, those two pretty much go hand in hand. Would I change my ratios with Aperol? I probably wouldn't initially. I'd want to make it as called for, and see how it tasted. All other spirit cocktails you don't hate. There is an all spirit cocktail that I do. It doesn't have a name. It's a, a creation that I made um, and it's equal parts gin, uh, Lille Blanc, and uh, yellow chartreuse. And I really like that cocktail. It's extremely well balanced. Um, just, it's very good. And I can tolerate a Manhattan. I think Manhattans are good. Um, I know Tyler and I were talking the other day and there's a black Manhattan and I can tolerate that as well. But really, I, I just, I'm lazy. If I'm gonna do an all spirits cocktail, I'd rather just enjoy spirit by itself. Oh, the Chinar cocktail I created. Uh, so it's the same, it's the same as uh, the other one that I was talking about. So what you would do is equal parts gin, uh, Chinar, and uh, Lillet. That one is, that one actually is super, super good. I really do like that one a lot. Black Manhattan, yes. Uh, Black Manhattan is um, basically a regular Manhattan um, Tyler, help me on this one. What were we talking about? You sub of, of, uh, Amaro Nonino. So what you're going to be doing is, I want to say you put more Amaro Nonino in that. I can't really remember right now off the top of my head. Yeah, that's it. Amaro instead of vermouth. So you build the Manhattan as, as normal. Um, but instead of using the, uh, sweet vermouth, you would add Amaro Nonino as your sweetening agent, sweetening agent. All right. <laughs> yeah, Tyler, where you at? Do some... <laughs> uh, birthday bourbon. Oh, Old Forester birthday bourbon, or Old Forester prohibition. Daydreaming, that is a good question. 
Um, if we're going off of last year's releases, uh, so if we're going to do 2016 Birthday Bourbon versus uh, the Prohibition 1920, I would go with Prohibition all day long over last year's Birthday Bourbon release. I actually did a side-by-side -side with them, um, and I much preferred that. I did a flight of birthday bourbons when I was in Colorado. I think I posted it to my uh, Instagram uh, feed where I think I did 2012 through 2016. And uh, there is a noticeable difference between all the batches significantly. Um, but when it comes to 2016 birthday bourbon versus Prohibition, you can see by the comments, all day long Prohibition. It's a fantastic bottle. Um, it's easy to acquire. Uh, drinks great and it's also a bottle that when you open it up and you let it sit for a few months it gets even better um, it just really mellows and even more characteristics um, come out yeah 2016 was not there's a signature taste to birthday bourbon it's kind of like a how could i say it it's like a little bit of a nail polishy taste to it um it's subtle, but it's there, and you can definitely pick it out. Um, I've kind of grown to love it a little bit, but if they, you know, if they keep releasing stuff like the 1920, I mean, I'll take that all day long. Any other questions? <laughs> Chris and Tyler are getting all amped. Huh? <laughs> America whiskey pot. Yes, yeah, everybody. Yeah, that's what it is. It's like a, that, that, yeah, rubbing alcohol, nail polish, it's there in that one. You're welcome, Dave Ramming. All right. Well, uh, thanks for those that joined. We learned a little bit about uh, stirring a cocktail tonight. And so it was fun to share that with you guys. And I'm going to get to uh, finishing this cocktail. I'll see you all next week. And I think... Just so you guys know, next week, the cocktail that we're lining up is a honey basil sour. Um, it's actually going to be vodka based. Um, everyone tends to hate on vodka. And uh, I'm going to show you a cocktail next week that is absolutely phenomenal uh, with vodka and really fun to make.